This is Karen Launchbot at the University of Idaho. We're going to continue on discussions in the integrated rangeland management class. And when doing rangeland management, one of the things we really need to understand is how plants respond to disturbance, whether it be grazing or fire or mowing. Any kind of disturbance on the land is really one of the things that we use to manage or change plant communities. So today we're going to talk about some of those elements of how plants respond to, to disturbance. The essence of the story that we'll talk about today is the location of meristems because the, the kind of meristem and where it's located makes a lot of difference in terms of how a plant can respond to, to disturbance such as grazing or fire. You probably have a general idea of what a, a meristem is. Uh, so meristem is the, the type of in, undifferentiated cells that are very small and they're all in one area. And if if you, that area starts to swell, we would call it a bud. So if we can see it with human eye, we'd call it a bud. So these are the same thing. They're undifferentiated cells, meaning that they are just sort of the, the blank of a cell. They haven't become something specific like a leaf, stem, root, or seed. But they could develop into a differentiated cell. There's three basic types of meristems in a plant. In any plant, there's an apical meristem, which is at the apex or terminal. So they're at the tips of the shoots and roots, and they're responsible for shoot and root growth. There's, there's one that's facing up to increase the, the length or, the, or the, a distance of a plant up above the soil. There's also one that is at the tip of the roots that is extending the roots down into the soil. Uh, there are also axillary or lateral buds. Lateral buds are, are ones that kind of in, increase the girth of the plant. They're on the sides. La lateral means on either side. So they're on the sides of the plant and they um, are in the axils of leaves and stems just, just above the node. We'll talk more about that. And they're responsible for growth uh, of lateral stems and roots. Um, intercalary um, meristems are intercalary means in the middle. So they're in the middle and they're only on grasses. Uh, they're responsible for the expansion of leaf sheaths and internodes. Flowering plants like shrubs and forbs generally don't have intercalary. Well, in fact, they don't have intercalary meristems. So let's uh, begin by talking about forbs and woodies and get the principles laid down and then we'll apply them to grasses. Um, meristems or buds uh, are really on, of two types in forbs and woody plants because they don't have intercalary meristems. Uh, apical buds are the ones at the top, so they turn into flower heads uh, or seed heads um, as the plant matures. So they're the ones at the top of the plant that are expanding it up above the soil surface. Axillary, again, in the leaf axils or the stem axils, and they're responsible for new stems. So you see there's a, a red dot kind of in the middle of this slide, that, that would be an axillary bud, and that's where all of those um, shoots off that main stem were formed from axillary buds. Again, uh, forb and woody plants don't have intercalary meristems. There's some exceptions, interesting exceptions, like equicetum, which is horsetail. It's a plant that doesn't have leaves. It just has a stem, so it does have intercalary meristems. Thinking again about those nodes, uh, are, or those buds being right above the node. So here's just a couple examples of what I mean by that. The nodes are the, the kind of round circles on a stem, the kind of ankles along the stem, and then the area between those is the internode. And where a leaf is, that would be a node or a stem. And then at the base of that leaf is a bud. And those buds are what give rise to new stems. There's a few other types of meristematic activity that are worth mentioning. Uh, sometimes lateral meristems are uh, also form uh, spines and thorns on plants. So he, here's an example of just above the bud, you'll see a spine or a thorn in this case. Uh, adventitious meristems are ones that um, they, they're just kind of accidental. They are growing points that arise on the root or the stem, and they have no real connection to the apical meristem. So they're not under the control of the apical meristem. They're not true lateral meristems, but they can give rise to new shoots and roots. You often will hear about adventitious roots. So they're roots that, that come about sort of ad hoc and somewhere along the root, main root. So adventitious are, they are meristems, but they are kind of accidental. They, they occur anywhere. That term adventitious means, you know, it kind of just occurs anywhere it's needed. 
Now, I've been talking about that. I just mentioned that dominance of the apical meristem over the axillary buds. So there is a connection between the axillary buds and the apical meristem. And that apical meristem has control over the axillary buds in something called apical dominance. This might be familiar if you took a plant physiology or botany class. But it's really important if we're going to try to change plants in the ecosystem where we're going to look at how plants have changed uh, because of fire or grazing. And here's how that works. The apical meristem, if that apical meristem is removed, then the axillary buds that are below it are stimulated to grow. So if you remove that top apical meristem, then the, the shoots and flowering stems below the, the tip, they'll start to grow because they're, they're essentially re released from that dominance. The dominance is created by a, a combination of, of hormones, but also kind of con um, controlling the resources available. So that, that apical meristem is the one that really dominates and controls the growth in, in a stem or a plant. The axillary buds then are stimulated to grow and they become their own apical bud for the stem that they are at the tip of. So it's a little bit confusing, but what happens is when that apical bud is removed, the axillary buds are stimulated and they start to grow. And then those secondary stems uh, become, you know, dominant stems with the, that axillary bud becoming an apical bud. Here's a, just an example. Maybe you can uh, take a look at this, that in the middle of that, there's a dead stem. And what happened to that was that was the apical bud at one time and it was removed. And then you can see how those axillary buds were um, stimulated and they became pretty strong buds of their own. And the bud on the left is interesting because it looks like it was eaten again or, or somehow removed again. And now we have another stem that was an axillary bud that is now stimulated and it's growing down off to the left. So all of these kind of what are starting to look like main stems were created because that apical bud was removed and they were stimulated. Uh, when we look at shrubs that seem heavily hedged or in ornamental val in ornamental practices, we'll, we'll clip off that axillary bud. So I'm sorry, we'll clip off, clip off the apical bud so the axillary buds are stimulated and then the plant becomes more bushy. We do this a lot um, in horticulture in our garden plants where we take off that apical bud so that we get more flowers coming out of the plant. I'm going to switch now to grass morphology and it's a little bit different so there's just some terminology we got to get behind us here. Uh, on the left that phytomer organization. A phytomer is a, a group of uh, parts of the plant. So the blade plus the sheath. Sometimes at that joint between the blade and the sheath is a ligule. It's just a little sheath that is right at the, the blade or the collar or the, it's right at the joint between the blade and the sheath or the collar. Uh, then uh, that all wraps around an inner node. The inner node is that stem or the straw of a grass, and then those bumps along the stem are the nodes. Right above the node is the axillary bud. So those units together create a phytomer. So a blade plus a sheath plus an inner node and a node create a phytomer. Phytomers are just stacked up in the plant to create a tiller. So they just one right on top of another. And then if you have several tillers, or individual stalks of a plant, then you have a plant, a grass plant. Take a look at some of that. Here again is a phytomer. Got a leaf, we've got a sheath that goes around the stem, we've got an inner node, we've got two nodes, and and then the, the bud is the axillary bud. That yellow line is pointing to the axillary bud that's right above the internode. If it could, um, it's the part of the plant that could create a new stem or a new tiller. Intercalary buds then are right at the base of the leaf, the sheath, and the, and the internode. So those intercalary meristems are the ones that would cause expansion of the leaf, sheath, and internode. Here's what that looks like in real life. Um, you would see here that the uh, apical bud becomes the seed head, and those axillary buds are at the base of an internode. On the right hand of plant, here's that inner node. There's the leaf. There's the sheath that wraps around the internode. Here's the internode for that phytomer. It's below the sheath. There's actually another sheath wrapping around it. 
and then right at the base of that inner node would be the node, the, the axillary bud node. Uh, so the axillary bud is there, and then the intercalary buds would be at the base of that leaf, and they'd be at the base of the sheath, and they'd be at the base of the inner node. Now, most of the life of a plant, those that internodes are very compressed. They're just really small. And the location of the meristem then is really at the base of the plant. So when you have what they call, what is called culmless plants here, without a culm, a culm is that when you get those internodes or that stem, that's called the culm. So when you have a culmless plant, that means that those internodes are just smooshed right at the base of the plant. And you can see there's a diagram in the middle, that apical meristem is right at the tip of that and the the internodes are all smooshed together there as those expand up those axillary buds and those nodes expand up the plant and they so they sort of telescope up and then it, the plant becomes calmed so that's all terminology if you're not real familiar with grasses that's that's kind of grass terminology calmless and then once those internodes begin to fill in and telescope the plant up then it would be calmed or it become calmed. Here's what the, a grass looks like when it's calmless. As soon as the spring starts to uh, occur in your neck of the woods, you might try to dig down and see if you can get any stem. And what you'll find is all the apical meristems and, and most of the axillary buds are just way at the base of the plant. And all the leaves that we see above this the plant are just sheaths and leaves that are well above the inner node and they're sticking way up. But the those I'm sorry, well above the axillary buds. So that zone at the bottom is where the axillary buds and the apical bud are all smushed way down there. And you can kind of see that kind of roughness at the very base of the plant there, which are all of those internodes smushed down. Okay, smushed down, that's not very a good botany terminology, but here's what it looks like in another way. I'm just trying to help you envision this. If you cut one of those very short grasses that had not become calmed right down the middle, you'd see just a bunch of sheaths all just kind of stacked up. And those inner nodes are just that little space be between those sheaths. The apical meristem is right on the top of all those inner nodes. And right now this plant is calmless. And the plant on the right would be an example of one where the, the calm has not yet started. So it's just all leaves and sheaths. Maybe this will help. Maybe you might be able to see that a little bit more clearly. Here's a grass on the right that the, it has become calmed. There is a seed head on it, but still at the base. When you cut that, when you when you look close at it, what you see is just overlapping sheaths and, and leaves. Those dead sheaths and leaves probably happened earlier in the season and they grew and then they, they stopped and became dormant, but they're all just kind of coupled up on top of each other. And there's uh, I'm pointing to a new tiller in this diagram. That new tiller is coming out of one of those sheaths, meaning one of those axillary buds at the base of the plant has been stimulated, and now we have a new tiller. So an axillary bud down where all of those inner nodes are still crunched together has become activated, and it is now forming its own new tiller. Now let's turn our attention to intercalary meristems. Again, intercalary meristems are in between. They're very strong and distinct and important in grasses. They're the region at the base of the sheath, I'm sorry, the base of the inner node, the sheath, and the blade that produce new cells for expansion. So they're able to continue creating cells and, and getting that sheath, inner node, and blade to expand up. Again, Forbes and Woodies do not have intercalary meristems. Um, they have all new growth that has to come from that apical or axillary buds and existing cells in the plant. So what does this matter? Well, why, why do we care? The reason it's important is because uh, grasses are really well adapted to, uh, to grazing because they, they have these intercalary meristems that can cause really quick growth and recover of the grass, grass after defoliation. Uh, think about it uh, when you mow your lawn, all of those um, meristems are at the base of the plant and when you mow it it starts to become ragged right away that that raggedness is occurring because of the intercalary meristems this diagram is a little bit complicated but i want to just clarify how important these meristems are in terms of how much uh, they contribute to the biomass of the plant 
and then uh, how quickly they respond. So intercalary meristems respond very quickly. Within hours, uh, when a plant is disturbed, they'll start to expand and they can uh, contribute to growth uh, really quickly. Uh, apical meristems are ones you know, they're at the tip of the plant and they're continuing to grow and differentiate uh, new tillers, uh, new leaves, new sheaths, and they're, and they're continue to create new tillers. So they're quite important for biomass, but they really have control over that one stem or that one tiller they're on. So they respond and they grow quite quickly, but their contribution to biomass is kind of moderate. On the far right hand side, the most growth in a plant would, would come from those axillary buds. When they are uh, stimulated, they have the potential to produce a, a very large new tiller that will have lots of new biomass, but that takes a long time to do. So we rely on axillary buds to create more biomass, but they take a long time to, to start and be stimulated and differentiate new cells. And again, that, that arrow going back is that once an axillary bud is uh, stimulated to grow, it will eventually become its own apical meristem. So axillary buds stimulated to become apical meristems. All of them will have intercalary meristems as they grow. I talk about those intercalary meristems being stimulated. Here's just an example. If you had a young plant that was cut off, those intercalary meristems start to create cells and they just sort of telescope the growth up from the base of the plant. And on the right hand, you can see some old stems at the base that now have died. And if this plant uh, were cut, though, that intercalary meristems are the ones that are pushing it up into the, into the, you know, towards the sun. I'm going to say this a lot of different ways and show different diagrams because it's a little complicated. But on the top, you have an example of a plant that if it, its growing points are close to the ground as early in the season they are, and you, re, you, you removed it, you mowed it or grazed it, and the growing points remained intact, then what you would see is those intercalary meristems would start to grow up, and the first response you'd see of the plant would be from those intercalary meristems. If that uh, apical meristem was removed because those apical meristems are higher up they can be removed so in this bottom example of switchgrass if the growing points were up higher on the plant and then they were mowed off then the only response the plant has those those most of the intercalary meristems there are just they're just gonna continue until their own leaf and sheath is um, expanded and then new growth will have to come from the base of the plant, from those basal buds, those basal buds or um, axillary buds, and we form new tillers. So it takes longer, it takes more energy if those apical buds are removed. Uh, not to forget that um, when the plant is disturbed, another form, another area of growth is from rhizomes and stolons. And those are, rhizomes and stolons are actually modified stems that could give rise to new um, tillers. Uh, in the case of a stolon, they just sort of, they're along the ground surface. And at each of those nodes, they could put roots down and they could put stems and sheaths and blades up above that node. The rhizomes are below the ground, but the same thing happens. It's, it's a modified stem. At any one of those nodes, it could form roots and send a new shoot up. I said that that would happen in if the plant was disturbed. It actually happens with or without disturbance. Those buds can be initiated. Um, they can be stimulated to initiate a new tiller. The location of the meristem really is important when we're talking about how is the plant going to respond to disturbance. And always just think about where that early in the season most of the meristems are at the base of the plant. They're, they're pretty close to the ground and pr protected in grasses, protected because they're close to the ground. And this on the right hand side, you'll see there's a plant that has lots of meristems and it is those, those uh, the seed heads are just starting to come out of the sheath now. So this is a plant that is just beginning to initiate flowering. So it's telescoping up, it's bolting up and those flowers are still in the boot. Those, those seed heads are still in the boot. So later in the season, we have a, a situation where those, um, those seed heads are elevated. The plant begins to telescope up and 
then they are more subject to removal. So if you had a grazing animal come along, it could remove that apical meristem. So bottom line, what do you need to know and how will it affect management? Well, in order to understand where regrowth will come from a plant, you do have to understand meristems. And first of all, that depends on the type of plant, grasses versus forbs and, and browse. And the main reason that's important is because grasses have intercalary meristems, forbs and browse do not. So where growth is going to come from will depend on the type of plant. Also have to remember and think about and look for what part of the plant was removed. Was it vegetative or was it meristematic? If a vegetative stem or leaf was removed, in the case of grasses, those intercalary meristems could be stimulated to, to, to uh, add more leaf or sheath material. In the case, case of forbs and shrubs, that, that leaf will remain and it might uh, get a little bit larger as the cells uh, mature but it's not going to get new cells in that leaf or stem. Uh, if meristematic material is removed, then it depends on whether it was the apical meristem or axillary buds, and, and then they'll respond uh, depending on whether the apical meristem was removed or not. So the number and type of meristems remaining is also important. Um, the, the plant, some plants especially have uh, meristematic limitations. They don't have a lot of meristems from which they can respond uh, from grazing. So paying attention to the type of plant, what kind of meristems it includes, what meristems were removed, and whether it was just vegetative or meristematic. The last factor that's really important is does the plant have uh, resources for recovery? Remember grazing is an important inherent um, activity on rangelands. Fire and grazing define rangelands. So the plants on rangelands generally have resources and abilities abilities to recover after yeah. removal sometimes that only the only option is to go back to the seed and germinate a new plant but uh, at least in the case of grazing it's just really common that most of these plants have a way to recover and how well they recover uh, depends on the resources available is it early in the season when there's nice temperatures and there's plenty of soil moisture for recovery or is it really late in the season where opportunities for recovery are limited so those are some basics. If you're not real familiar with meristems, it might be a little confusing. Just always remember apical meristem, which has control over axillary buds, and then grasses have intercalary meristems.